time speed. So even if it's too at a slow portion, you're actively engaged the entire time trying to keep up with it. The other thing is, if you come to a section that you don't understand, just rewind it, play it back at one times, and honestly just make sure that you're getting every single portion of that content that you're trying to absorb. And then finally, make sure that you're reading and listening whenever possible. I know that in the mornings, it's a really good idea to wake up with a book or some kind of content to get your brain flowing. On top of that, you can carry it anywhere. Say you're at an airport and you have time to kill. You can read a book for, say, an hour instead of watching the kids run around the airport and run them up. You can learn speed reading and make forms, articles, like I said, books. It's also a really good deep stressor for making sure that you're keeping your stress levels down so you can function at an optimal state as a human being. And on top of that, you can pair audiobooks and physical books so you're getting your content through a visual medium and you're also hearing it back in your ears so there's a better chance of retaining what you're reading and learning. In addition, everyone here has to drive to work, right? That's kind of what we do. You can listen while you're riding to work. You can listen during chores, during workouts. You're using time that would otherwise be wasted and using it to gain something. And even if staying with this model, say listening is only 5% retention, 5% over say you spend an hour a day in your commute, five hours a week, however many that would be in a year, just growing over time, even 5% is more than zero. So even if it's not very beneficial, you're still getting retention. And even especially like new topics, even just hearing the words over and over again and starting to be able to create connections between what you think they mean and what they actually mean will be beneficial to you just over time. And also, with this, we want to make sure there are plenty of podcasts out there and lots of lectures. Like, for example, even like YouTube videos, they'll put lectures up on there and you can just play that in the background as whenever you're doing anything else. And also, make sure you're diversifying what you're doing. Like, don't just strictly do things, or don't just strictly read or something else because. Our brains contain information and they absorb it in multiple different mediums. And if you can maximize your absorption, you have the best chance of learning as quickly as possible. So you can become an expert in as many things as you want with as much speed and efficiency. And also, make sure you're taking care of yourself because your mind rests inside your body. And that means you want to make sure you're getting eight hours of sleep or however much lets you function well, or you're drinking water, working out, eating well. Because if you can take care of yourself, you don't have to worry about nagging pains or issues within your own body, and you can focus on more important things, like figuring out how to cure cancer. Now I'm gonna get you guys involved real fast, just so we can have some fun with this. I'm gonna put some pictures up on screen, and I want you guys to figure out in 30 seconds some different connections between us, so we can try to practice making connections between different topics. You guys ready? Anyone got any ideas? Yes, ma'am. Airplanes. Okay, airplanes. Yeah. Anyone got anything else? They both have a hard time getting up there. That's true. <laughs> What's up? So we got run before we can fly? Yeah. Anyone else got any different connections? So, with this one, the thing that I was getting at in like the real world situation is that Leonardo da Vinci actually created a wingsuit that was mimicked directly after birds. And if you look at like all different types of stealth aircraft, they're modeled directly after birds because their ability to just cut right through the air. You ready for another one? That's true. Good at making people disappear. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> During the
Cold War, the CIA actually put <coughs> on magicians to teach their operatives how to do tradecraft in the field with an audience being Russian operatives trying to figure out what was going on in, in information exchanges. Just pretty interesting. So now I'm going to cover some different accelerated learning techniques to leverage the fact that you want to be efficient with your time. If you're trying to become an expert in, say, mathematics, or you're trying to become an expert in, say, chemistry, or these different, like, larger subdomains, you have a lot of content to cover. And the faster you can do it, the better it will be for you, and less painful, hopefully, in the end. So first off, you want to make sure you can find community. Like, go out to conferences like this one, um, find, like, local organizations in your area, like OWASP or InfraGuard or for um, InfoSec specifically. But, like, just make sure that you're finding people you can communicate with, because they can not only motivate you, but they'll give you some type of, um, they're going to make sure that you're actually doing the work that you say you're going to be doing. They can make sure that you're going out and learning the things that you want to. They're going to keep you accountable for your actions, and they're going to keep you accountable for your path you want to take. If you can get a like-minded group of people, that everyone can work together towards this goal. And make sure you're setting goals for your knowledge and performance, depending on the skill. Because if you're just going in blindly, you're just going to wander a path that may or may not be effective. But if you know you want to go from point A to point B to C to D, and eventually all the way over there, be able to do any number of things you want in that subdomain, you want to make sure you're setting goals. Because it not only will motivate you, but it will also keep you accountable, like I was saying with the last one. It will just make sure that you're pushing yourself. To, and with goals, you want to make sure that they're specific and that they have a time frame dealt with them. If you say that you want to learn Python, but you don't give it a time frame, you could do that in five years from now, you could do it next week. Like there's no real urgency in it, and you're not going to be motivated individually. And also make sure you have <coughs> connections between different things. Because you can call one idea, but with it you're able to call other ideas in unison. And you can jump between different ideas rapidly. You'll be able to access the information that you have inside <coughs> your mind extremely quickly. And the whole point of having this insecurity is that you'll be able to look at a problem that's going on and know umpteen different ways you can attack that problem and solve it and protect infrastructure or whatever your end goal is with it, whether you're an attacker or a defender. Now, I'm going to get into some specific methods and start off, we're going to talk about the DIS method by Tim Ferriss. So what this is, is a rapid method to pretty much get the main idea of a content area before you're diving in and really getting into the nitty gritty of it and the specifics. So D stands for deconstruct. So you want to determine the smallest possible unit to learn by. Like say if you're using some kind of like online learning content, you have modules, you have like different chapters. You want to like break it down so you're learning a chapter at a time or a module at a time. Or for example, at Dell Tech we use test out. So say you'd want to go through one module at a time and make sure you're hitting all of these concepts. Next, you want to interview talk to experts to see what they find as the most important information in that content area. Because ultimately, they're the ones who know what's going on in it. They're the experts. Then you want to select what 20% you should focus on. Because the general idea is that 20% of the content will give you 80% of the results. You won't be all the way there, but you'll be the majority of the way there. And you can fill in that other 20% or however much it ends up being in your content area on your own time, but in a much more concentrated and confined manner. So it'll be more rapid. You also want to sequence it. So figure out what order to cover these blocks in. For example, if you want to learn networking, you don't want to be learning about internet routing before you understand how IP addresses work. It's going to be putting the horse, I mean the horse before the cart. And then stakes. You want to give yourself some type of cost for failure. Figure out what happens if you don't get this goal done. You don't figure out what this new content area or process or whatever the information you're trying to gather is. This will give you motivation, and it also will give you some type of urgency to say, I need to get this done now, or I need to work on this, and I need to make time every week. Because the whole point of being going towards a polymath is that this is lifelong learning. You're not just going to sit here, learn two topics, and be done with it. Like The whole point is, to go out into the world and continuously be growing and learning. You should be learning as much, if not more, now than you should be in 10, 20, 30 years. Because the whole point is to be lifelong learning and always growing as a person. It's not just some type of static goal. Next, the Feynman technique by Richard Feynman. So 
this is really useful for determining if you actually fully understand a subject or not. So what you do is you get a piece of paper, you pick your topic, and then you write that on top. So say using networking again, say I want to make sure I understand the subject. I write the top of my paper, and I explain that topic as simply as possible, as if I were trying to teach it to a child. You want to determine your weaknesses in that. So what that makes you do is say, I can explain this much of it, but this part's still kind of fuzzy, and this part's I can't even hit at all. You can go back and refine in step three what those areas actually mean, or if they like your understanding of them. And you're gonna repeat that back and forth until you can fully explain this topic on such a simple level that anyone can understand it. And after that, you wanna go back and start implementing analogies with the whole idea of creating connections in your brain. <coughs> Say you reference an orange in your um, explanation of subheading. If you can connect many things over multiple similar subjects or objects, you'll be able to rapidly pull ideas out of your brain just like that. Next, you also want to try to make it fun for yourself. So game-based learning is new and on the rise and up and coming. For example, this is a screenshot of a game called Screeps. What you do is you control these little like robots that spawn out of a little um, dot on the screen. But the entire control of the game is through JavaScript. Everything you do is controlled through a terminal or through scripting. So this could be really useful, say, in a programming setting of teaching students how to learn JavaScript, because instead of having to say, oh, okay, make this calculator, oh, make this database query, or any different number of subjects or topics or projects you could be doing, you tell them you want them to be the best on your personal server. Because the cool thing, you buy the game, it's like 15 bucks on Steam, and then you can host your own server, and it's run on MongoDB. And your students do, can just connect in, and it just it's always running around the clock because they're programming scripts, which means there's no real user interaction needed to be done with it. So you can also use it, say, in a larger scale setting to test different ideas you have about AI learning, because it's compatible with that, too. And just the whole idea of, if you can find fun ideas and fun concepts to make your learning more interesting, you're going to enjoy yourself more. Now that topic is specifically in our domain, Make sure you're doing CTFs and competitions. Things like National Cyber League or Collegiate Cyber Defense Competition or even like at these um, conferences how they'll have like Pros versus Joes or Net Wars from SANS. Make sure you're competing in different events that are actually testing your information security skills. Because the whole point of this is to make sure you are extremely rapid and extremely effective at determining what knowledge you want out of an environment. <coughs> And right there from my teacher, Jared Bates, he was talking about how he can either push you into the pool or you can do it yourself in terms of learning from CTFs. And it's your, your best bet to get in there as soon as possible. Like for me, I'm a freshman. I did a US cyber camp over summer. And these CTFs alone, like National Cyber League, have just been the biggest help to me. Because I didn't understand what Wireshark was or how to use it beforehand. And thanks to these competitions and having to learn what the tools do, I can semi-effectively use Wireshark to analyze web traffic now, which I never would have known before. So it puts you in different situations that are more real world than saying, hey, write this paper, or hey, do this small quiz from a textbook that you may or not be learning about. Now, for really stubborn topics, I would suggest Anki flashcards. What they are is they're flashcards online set up with audio, visual, and text. So that means you'll be able to absorb multiple mediums at once. And I know a lot of people use these for, say, like languages or things, like German, Japanese, um, Russian, any kind of like com complicated language. They're going to use this because it lets you really just absorb the content and lets you pull it from different areas. Now, on the topic of working, I'm going to pull up a couple different Japanese methods that are really effective. For example, Kanban. So what you do is, in the topic of learning, you can figure out all the different skills you want to learn in that subdomain, like using the disk method, you figure out the different blocks you want to learn. You put them on sticky notes over in a to-do column. Then you have your do today column. That's what you're going to focus on in this specific time. And you can set it for any time that you want. Do this week, do this month. Just something where you're organizing it down by, these are my next goals. You have those over here. When you effectively start working on them, you're going to move them over to an in-progress area. And you limit this to, say, four to six items at one time. Because the more you divide your attention, you're wasting brain power by dividing between multiple topics. I think it's five or ten percent you lose every time in concentration. You're switching between topics. 
So if you really focus in, you'll be time efficient, but you're also going to be able to make really close connections between these different areas. And finally, going back to the idea of you want to be always motivating yourself to keep going, this is a lifelong thing, this is a marathon, not a sprint. You have a done category that shows you what you've already accomplished and what you can go forward and say, I've done all these things, which means I know no matter how long it'll take me, I will get to this point eventually. Now, Kaizen is this idea that every day, if you improve in very minuscule ways, you'll be exponentially better in a year or even in a longer scale. And this idea says that you improve 1% every day. So, for example, if you want to say, have the goal of working out in the morning, the first day, you just wake up early for when your time would actually start. The second day, you put your shoes out. The third day, you put your clothes out. And over time, because you're slowly ingraining small, minute details, over time, it's going to just become a habit. It's kind of like if you're playing music and you keep playing one section over and over and over again, you slowly build up a song throughout and just measure by measure. You're going to know that first measure really well, and the last one might be a little bit shady or flaky, but you're going to understand the majority of that extremely quickly. And if you're only improving 1% every day, that's 365% in a year, you're taking it literally. Which is a lot better than not even starting, or being able to start, but then stopping some point soon because you just don't know where to go from there. Now, this is a really good technique you can pair with Kanban, which is the Pomodoro technique, which says you study for 25 minutes, you take a five minute break, and you repeat that Pomodoro, that 30 minute cycle, one to three more times, then take a 15 minute break. What that does, it keeps you moving quick, but also lets you intensely focus on that 25 minutes because you know you get a five minute rest. And in that rest, you can do whatever you want. Say you want to go text a friend or go play solitaire or go for a walk or get some food or something. You always have a little five minute break to look forward to so you know even if you're intensely focused and you get frustrated on something, you have a break in the future. And then every couple of Pomodoros, you can just take a long break and just get away from the subject and then reconvene on it later. The other useful thing for this is if you're tracking your progress and trying to build yourself up over time using that Kaizen technique, you can just add another Pomodoro in. So say for one month you're going to take one Pomodoro a day and learn about, say, chemistry. And then the second month you take two Pomodoros and then so on and so forth until you have the amount of time that is reasonable for your schedule and your life that still maximizes the amount of time you're spending every day or every week or every month learning about the subject you really intensely want to learn about. Now, we're going to talk about this specifically in the security fields now, with all of that behind us. And specifically, I want to talk about physical, because that's what I really enjoy. Because I know that this is overall a cyber conference, but security as a whole goes outside of just the virtual environment. There are physical servers and physical machines that are being interfaced with. And if someone can get access to those machines, you're owned, honestly, because they can do whatever they want to them whether that be reset the server or gain physical access to them and then escalate privileges. So visual skills for security professionals would be anything that you want to can focus on as InfoSec related specifically. So these might be good areas to start if you want to hone in on your InfoSec skills first or if you find these really interesting. Like for example, forensics is massive and it's just constantly growing. They have things like cloud security now with the advent of Cloud technology is growing and growing and growing where it's going. You have, your, of course, your red team and your blue team, so your offense, your defense. You have things like risk mitigation. Also, you have computer science. That's where all of this came from. We're honestly just a small little niche portion of computer science because we're all either breaking things and figuring out how we broke them to take advantage of it or fixing things with duct tape and super glue. That's all we're really doing here and just preventing it so that way people can't get access to data or information that they're not supposed to have access to. That's all our entire job is. We're banking on the fact that people are going to be rude and that other people need protection. Now, there's also physical skills for security professionals as a whole. For example, you can look at the military as security professionals. They're providing physical security to a nation. Or you could look at cops, or you could look at security guards. Any number of things that can go out and actually provide physical protection for your systems or physical protection for your assets. You have things like access control systems and locks, so actually that human interface with it. You have imaging equipment, so that way you can observe and you can really hone in on what's going on in that specific sector and should that be a threat or not. 
you have things like vehicles if you say interested in that because of course there's always people trying to use vehicles to cause harm to other people all the terror attacks in Europe now are starting to be with vehicles and just driving through crowds how can you effectively stop that so that way we can protect the public that's of course an issue for us too because we're part of the public you know if you say you want to learn personal defense and you take that to a more personnel security route you have weapons you have martial arts you have fitness because if you can't run 100 yards you can't really protect the president you have things like operation security and recon and escape and evasion and all these different skills that build up to more important more intrinsic things you also have say for example social engineering like how cool would it be to just walk into any random building and be able to get to the ceo's office just with your mouth just like hi guys and you just somehow get up there It'd be the coolest thing ever you have things like, say for example, public speaking, this. Being able to share your information with other people and benefiting the security community by sharing what you learn and what you know, you'll be able to grow the community because if we can band together and share what we all know, it's like trying to take, say, a password cracking and you put it out to 100 different computers. All of them are contributing and all of them are helping back. So if we could all do that and make sure that we're all contributing back to each other, we can grow the community as a whole like rapidly. And also, one thing that I really enjoy doing in my free time is making. Like learning how to interact with physical objects and take some random raw material and come out with a useful finished product. And that can just really be, in my opinion, the most satisfying thing in the world. And then tying back in once more to the access control stuff, RFID and SDR. Upstairs right now, they actually have SDR going on in the wireless village. And they also have a lockpick village set up right now, so you guys want to check that out. I don't know how much longer it would be open after this, but maybe just give it an idea, give it a shoot or something. Like I was saying, I absolutely love making things. So, specifically for security, maybe you want to look at soldering electronics because computers are developed on soldering electronics. Those massive, like full roof computers back in the 80s, or just giant capacitors and tubes that were doing all the transmits thing. But now, it's simple and easy for a home user. You have things like Arduino, you have Raspberry Pis, you have BeagleBone, all these different like $35 components you can just buy off the internet and go learn about machine code or learn about binary or figure out how to say with a Raspberry Pi, make a uh, Pi hole so that way you have your own personal VPN. Because the better you can understand these topics at a lower level, the more you can understand how to exploit them. And then you have things like, say, 3D printing. That would be useful in conjunction with the soldering electronics because you can create cases for your devices or you can put them together and see how you can fit together and use CAD and all those different designing softwares. Then you have RFID and SDR because ultimately we share an absurd amount of information over the radio waves these days. Like our phones, we have NFC, we have all kinds of cell communications, we have Bluetooth, we have Wi-Fi coming out of them, I mean going to them and all these different things that interact with them. Like, who for example knows how easy it is to crack WEP just over the radio waves? Like you literally just point something at it and boom, it's gone. And you're in. Like there's so much information being shared over radio waves and even outside of that you have like, for example, restricted radio bands. So say you want to get your ham license so you could interact with more things. Or say you wanted to go out and toy around with like little access control cards. And then finally, um, this one's kind of a weird one, but music and photography. So, <laughs> um, if you find these hobbies interesting, learning to use them can be really useful in social engineering engagements. Learning any kind of physical skill that can get you in a door or in a back room. So say for example, you're doing a pen test at an area where they have um, news equipment set up. You can pose as a, user, um, as a film crewman and go in there, and if you know what you can talk about, and you know the subject matter, they're not gonna be able to just shoot you away real fast, because you're gonna try to turn the camera on and end up turning it off. And the other thing is, you can hide electronics in other devices, or you can hide stuff in any kind of equipment. For example, in guitars, you can hide um, any kind of like small electronic in the neck of the guitar, you can put them in acoustics, in the big, large drum, and you just close it up, or even with like, say for example, brass instruments, you can hide small metal objects inside of, say, the bell of a trumpet or the bell of a trombone, and it will be more obfuscated in terms of scanning of that object. 
and ultimately just gives you more covers for, say, social engineering. And that could go to other topics, too, and other skills that you may want to learn. But these are just two that I thought of off the top of my head. And then just some other things you may want to look into, for example. Um, these are things that aren't specifically security oriented, but they will allow you more areas to pull from in your search of trying to grab more ideas from different areas. So for example, material science or physics, you could be able to say, look at a server room and know that that wall, that's drywall, right? You can just go right through it. Or you just punch a hole in it and you can get to the other side of it. So say from a disruptive physical security side, you would know that putting the server room in something not made of gypsum would be more <coughs> useful because someone can't just drop right through from the other side of a wall and compromise your systems. Say if you could have like really high value data storage, that would be useful in that situation. Or say for example, high level math, pulling back to that computer science example, you'd be able to better understand what's going on on a smaller scale by understanding the fact that all computer science was was just really advanced math back in the day. It was just looking at different comparisons and different contrasting statements. And then specifically for cybersecurity, it'd be really useful to know your laws and know what's going on in your standards in that sector. Because the best thing is to be able to cover your ass and make sure that you're not going to be able to go into an engagement and then have a book thrown at you because you did something outside of your rules of engagement that isn't covered. If you know that you can do X, Y, and Z, and you know for sure that's fine, and someone tries to throw the book at you, and you have your cover, you're golden. You'll be safe, and you won't be spending three to five years plus in jail for something you didn't even really know was going to happen. And also, just pulling back to some other things, like say, for example, you want to learn more about chemistry, or you want to learn about architecture. These are things that also have like real world implications, and you could have backup plans for your job. Say InfoSec doesn't pan out for you. Want to try cooking to be a chef? I mean, we're all people here. We all need to make money. It's useful to have more than just one idea. Like the whole part about this talking about being a polymath and being able to pull from multiple areas, you want to have backup plans. You want to have redundancy. Because that's what keeps you safe. And that's the same thing in security, how you want to make sure that you can pull from as many topics as possible so that way you can attack every problem with as much ferocity as your attackers can. If you're blue teaming and you're only coming at it from a, one specific point of view, say the, college, like the majority of education is coming at all problems from this angle, you still have the rest of the circle to deal with. You still have people over in, say, Russia who have completely different um, philosophical ideas and like their societies are structured differently, so maybe they would come at it from a different angle than you would, or they have different skills that would make them attack a problem a certain way that you haven't thought of yet, or that hasn't really occurred to you as something that could be useful. The whole idea is that systems are just built weakly, and there's nothing we can do about that. There's always some way to get around something. But the thing is, if we can figure out how other people are going to be getting around those systems before they can do it, we can get there before they can. And we can stop them from compromising our systems before it actually happens. Now, do one more thing with audience involvement. This one's kind of weird, and I'm interested to see what you guys have to say about it. You guys ready? <coughs> They're both easy to penetrate with the right tool. <laughs> True. They, they both penetrate to solid objects. Mm -hmm. That's very true. <laughs> <laughs> they both drop off halfway distance. Mm -hmm. Everybody, anything else? So, why find tank shells? Since they both penetrate through objects, right? They both deal with the same kind of idea, which is the angle of impact and your penetration factor through that object. For example, at 90 degrees perpendicular to a surface, four inches of, say, a wall or armor is four inches if you're hitting it at 90 degrees. But say you're hitting it at 10 degrees, that four inches in Wi-Fi and in the same area with tank shells becomes close to two feet. The shallower your angle of impact of any kind of surface, the greater the path through that object will be to the other side. 
And that's why you have to be careful, say, when you're placing Wi-Fi routers, like directly on a wall, and you're trying to, say, host Wi-Fi up through this wall and into a floor right above it, you could be coming into interference issues. And the same thing with tank shelves. Say there's a tank right in front of me. If I slant my armor to the side, there's a better chance it'll try to penetrate my armor, but it'll be ricocheted or stopped by my armor instead because it's not going to be able to go all the way through it. Now, at this fork in the road of the talk, I hope that I can... <laughs> I hope I've convinced you guys that learning more than just your little niche sector of information security would be useful to you in the long run. Because if you can be a subject matter expert in, say, your own little made-up world, your own little made-up world can get you a $20,000 raise, it may be worth it. If you can figure out how to make yourself a better employee so you can stay employed, and so you can go to companies you want to work for, and you can just, throughout your entire career, advance like you want to, if you make yourself more profitable for your employer and you make yourself better as a whole, you're going to ultimately reap the rewards for it in the end. And honestly, our field is constantly changing, so why not try to stay ahead of things? If you're going to be learning about the new and up and coming things in your specific niche, why not learn about more areas? So you can also, say with your boss, be able to go to them and say like, hey, I know this is happening in a completely unrelated field, but we should do this because of it. And you'll stand out to them more. And on top of that, you can also just go to a conference and say, hey guys, guess what I can do? Just pull out a giant list of everything. If you're in that, of course. <laughs> so, if you guys have any questions, I'm gonna post up some different like resources I would suggest you guys look into. Um, like I was saying, make sure you guys are going to conferences, make sure you're competing. There's also different community outreach organizations like Infra or OWASP. Um, books are a really big help. Humblebundle.com will sell out different um, ebook bundles for like $15, and you'll get 20, 30 books in that little thing. And you just pop them on an e reader, and you have hundreds of pages of information. Websites, so you can practice different things like for um, web app pen testing or for wireless. You have Hack This Site or Hellbound Hacker. And also, SANS has a website called cyberaces.org for anyone that hasn't fully jumped into security yet. They have a basic course on Windows, Linux, and networking. So you can get that start in it. Or for anyone else who you want to get introduced to security, cyberaces.org is a really big help. It helped me a lot, I know. And then for things like physical security, which I really enjoy, Speakers like Deviant Olam and Sammy Kamkar are really, really helpful. Deviant Olam has a lot of talks on, for example, doors and locks and stuff. And Sammy Kamkar is a security researcher that actually does different hardware hacking things. Like, for example, garage door openers using kids' toys. Is that the guy that started the flight company? I think so. Or, uh, yeah. He was the Sammy bot. The yeah. Sammy, mm -hmm. Sammy one. <laughs> Yeah, on Sammy is my friend. From my <laughs> <laughs> and of course, make sure you guys are attending conferences. Coming up, we have ShmooCon in January. Besides Charms, will be out in a bit. Besides Nova, um, next year, if you guys can catch Besides DC, that was really good. And of course, you know, DEF CON, the biggest one of them all. Do you guys have any questions for me? Can you get a copy of the Um. Yeah, I can post them up. If you guys want to follow me on Twitter, it's at can underscore of underscore limes. <laughs> yeah, and it'll be on YouTube as well. Anyone have any more questions? Oh, oh, my first talk wasn't too bad. Thanks, guys. <laughs>